I love Camp Rock Creek. I've been going there since I was four or five years old to day camp, to overnight camp. I've been staffed there at numerous sessions. Uh, it was a week there that sparked me to give my life to Jesus, and I was baptized a Saturday after camp because I was too nervous to do it in front of people at camp. I know that shocks you, knowing me, that I was too nervous to do it in front of people. Uh, it was in that very pool also that I talked with a brother about, man, I really think I need to go into ministry and made that decision. And so now it's cool, years later, to be able to do camp with people like my brother and my best friends growing up and to get to do it at Choctaw now with all my new friends and new brothers and sisters here. So it's just a blessing uh, to be back at Camp Rock Creek with you guys and so many others. But I thought this evening uh, we would go through maybe a little bit about what we learned at camp. Uh, my role at camp this year was I spoke Sunday night. I was a Bible class teacher. I taught the juniors and seniors and some of the college age staff members uh, every day of the week. In fact, I ended up writing the Bible class curriculum that a lot of our teachers used and then made it their own. And so I thought, you guys need to know what we're teaching our kids a little bit, right? Um, that's probably good for you to know. And I think it applies to you as well. So we're going to do a quick little run through of our lessons during the week. It's not exhaustive. We're not going to dive into all the details that we shared with our kids. Um, but I want you to, hit, to hear some of the highlights and the big main messages uh, from our week. If you see my camp shirt and the shirt that all these other people stole from me, uh, you'll see what looks like Rafiki. And that's because the theme this year was all about identity and the big question of who are you? We wanted to answer that question or help our kids answer that question of who really are they? And the reason why we have Rafiki is because if you know the Lion King, there's a scene in which Simba leaves Pride Rock. He doesn't know who he is anymore. He runs into a funny, wise old baboon. And in this conversation with this baboon, the baboon says, I know who I am. The question is, who are you? And that's a question I think all of us need to answer in our life. But as you look, Sunday night when I preached to kind of start us off, this was maybe one of the big main messages, is that if you want to know who you are, you have to know the one that created you. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 tell us that we are made in the very image of God. That in the beginning when he created and he looked at us, he made us in his image. And we can speculate what all that means. But there is a part of us that in a way is like God. And why that is important is because if you try to understand who you are as a person, whether that's John, Mike, whoever it is, if you try to understand who you are without taking into account who your father, God is, you'll never really understand who you are. It's like trying to solve a puzzle without all the pieces. You think you have a good idea or a good picture, but there's always something missing. And so if you want to know who you are, you've got to turn to God to know, because he knows you better than anybody else. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, before uh, in your mother's womb, I knew you, is what he tells Jeremiah there. God knows you better than you know yourself. That might be hard for you to believe. You think, no one knows me like I know myself. God does. God knows you're good, you're bad, you're ugly, your personality, your attitude, everything about you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. Insert joke about how I've made that easier for God. But he knows you, and he's created you. And so this was a big reason of, hey, this is why we're going to go to the Bible all week to answer this question of who are we. Because we can't answer that without God's help. If we are made with something like him, we have to go to him to figure out what that is. If you try to answer it from a worldly perspective or just with your thoughts, your feelings, and your knowledge, you're going to miss something. And you'll never truly be able to explain all of you. And so that was a big idea to start. But another was this. When we talk about identity, the way that we defined it was it's your sense of self and self-worth or your sense of self and self-value. We often don't equate value with identity, but it plays a big part. But the message we wanted to get across to our kids this week was that your sense of self and self-value has to be in something that lasts. Today we put our identity in many things that are temporary. Just to give you some examples, think about the teenage girl who thinks everything about who she is is being the pretty one. That's how she defines her life. I'm the attractive one. Think about what happens over time as she ages. She's not going to look the same, right? Think about what happens if people don't affirm that she's pretty. 
or people don't tell her or like her posts or follow her or there's someone else who's prettier, her identity starts to crumble because she's put all of her worth and value in every part of who she is in this one little thing. This applies in other places. There's that boy who he thinks all he is is that great athlete. But what happens when he can no longer play that sport? What happens when there's someone better than him? That person who puts all of their identity in what they do, their career, what happens when you retire? What happens when you're not successful? If you're known as the good boy or the good girl, the good son, the good daughter, what happens when you fail? Does your identity crumble? See, we're trying to get them to understand we put so much of our identity in temporary things. Think of our world. We say, who are you? They say, I'm black, white, I'm American, or I'm Canadian, or I'm a dual citizen. We say, they say, I'm straight or I'm gay. They say, I'm a male, I'm female. They do this, that, and the other. A lot of what they identify themselves as is temporary, isn't it? They put identity in temporary feelings. They put identity in their temptations and their desires. They put it in a whole, new, a whole lot of places that their identity really shouldn't be. And we wanted our kids to understand there is, you have to put your identity in something that lasts, something that's eternal, only in God. And so starting Monday, uh, we, we talked about, uh, we looked at Ephesians chapter 2. We've, we've talked about this from this pulpit before numerous times. I won't read to you all of Ephesians 2 in those first 10 verses, but here are four snippets from Ephesians 2 that I think are important in terms of identity. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. We weren't telling our kids that, hey, you are great and perfect and wonderful just how you are. You don't have to change anything. Listen, that's antithetical to the gospel. The gospel tells us we're a broken, wretched people who need saving from ourself. So we weren't saying, hey, kids, it's all great. Don't change a thing. That's, that's not what we're saying. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, following the passions of your flesh, the desires of your body and mind. You were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Verse 4 and 5, But God, being rich in mercy, made us alive together. That he has done something wonderful for you to save you from that overwhelming weight of sin. And by grace, his grace, you've been saved through faith. And that's not your own doing. And we shared this passage with them, this passage with them for this main point. In Christ, your identity is received, not achieved. And I'll tell you, that's wonderful truth. If your identity is rooted in something where you have to perform to be it, it will cause you to crumble. If I have to be the pretty person or the athlete or good enough, if my identity, if I have to do it all the time, that's an overwhelming burden, isn't it? To live with every single day. And you're human, so you know what's going to happen? You're going to fail. And you can't be that all the time. But what's wonderful about Jesus is, yes, you're dead to your sin. Yes, you are broken. You are fallen. But because of what Jesus has done for you, you can have this wonderful identity in Jesus Christ that changes you that you don't have the pressure of I have to make it happen all the time because it's his perfect saving work on the cross that has saved you. It's not achieved. It's received. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't change who you are. It does. But it's a wonderful release of a burden to know that it's not about how good I am or that I don't have to make my identity or my worth or value happen, but it's in what God says about me and what God has done for me that gives me this identity. And that was big day number one. Here was Tuesday. Our lessons were about I am who you say I am. There's a song on Christian radio. We made it a cappella version. We sang it at camp. And it's who the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. And here we looked at Ephesians chapter 1 to understand who does he say we are. Now we, we've already looked at who he says we, we are without Christ. We also talked about how do you get this identity in Christ. And we looked at Romans 6 during the week of how we bury our sins in water, how we, uh, we die to our sin, we bury it, how we walk in newness of life to have this identity. But as once you're in Christ, who are you? 
And Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7 says this. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. Every spiritual blessing you could even fathom or imagine, God has given it to you through Jesus. He says you're blessed. He says you are chosen before the foundation of the world. But before any creation you know of, God made the decision to choose those who would choose him. God thought of you, and he thought of the fact that you might obey his gospel. And he said, I'm going to choose those people. You're chosen. Do you know what it's like to not be picked? To be last picked or to be overlooked? I, I can think of the days on the playground when we played basketball and we would all line up and we would have captains and we would pick teams. I always got picked, so I don't know what this is like. Um, but... No, but there's always someone who's kind of not picked. And, and that wasn't me in that case, but there's been other times in my life I've not been the one who's picked. You've been overlooked, not thought of, not, not uh, esteemed highly by others. God thought of you from the very beginning, or maybe before it. He says, he predestined us for, adoptions, for adoption as sons through Christ Jesus. We've been adopted. You know, it's one thing to have a father who creates us, and he did it willingly, not by force, but he chose to create us. That's a great love. Parents, you created your children. You love them in a way that it's hard to even explain. But then not only do you have a God who created you and loved you in that way, but then he's chosen to adopt you all over again through Jesus, knowing your failures and mistakes. He loves you. He wants you. He's blessed you in Jesus. And it says in him we have redemption through his blood. That the worst things you've ever done, the worst things you've ever said, your failures, your mistakes, your sin... He's wiped it away in Jesus because of his perfect blood. And this week we wanted to get across to these kids, hey, in Christ, this is who you are. How many of us are willing to admit that we struggle sometimes to believe what God says about us? Talking with kids this week, I'll tell you, they struggle. Even the ones in Christ, they, they, they struggle to believe, hey, I am blessed. I'm forgiven. I, I'm chosen, really? Someone wants me and loves me because they have a whole list of issues at home and in their life and they're struggling with concepts and ideas as they grow up and we wanted them to understand, listen, you are who God says you are and you need to believe it. And we talked a little bit about what keeps us from believing that we are who God says we are and it was interesting hearing some of their thoughts, at least with the junior and senior class. Um, a big one is their sin. Man, our young people... They feel overwhelmingly guilty of their sin. Almost all of my kids were Christians in my class, but they, they feel this burden. And it makes them question sometimes whether God still feels this way about them. You ever feel that way? You ever struggle with that? Yet God did all of this for you, and he says this about you, a flawed people who are in Christ. And we wanted them to believe this. Another part of why they struggle with this is because they are being bombarded every single day with messages from the world about who they really are or who they really aren't, I should say. The average screen time a day is very interesting for young people. Uh, you've probably heard me harp on phones for a few weeks now, um, but the average time a young person spends just watching videos a day, just videos, not everything else on their phone, is about five to six hours. Then you add others, and some of you are going, wow, but this is just normal. This is normal for me, for them, for all of us. We're, our phone has become everything in our life. They are receiving content every single day. And it's not saying, hey, Jake, this is who you really are. Don't listen to them. That's not how it works. It's subtle. But it's just messaging through content that we, we come to question who we really are and think we're things that we truly are in Jesus Christ. And we'll talk more about that in a way. But there's a lot of things keeping them from believing who they are. And we wanted them to understand, no, you are who God says you are. And the, the, the practical application for us was we need to hear and listen to God's voice often. We spend hours on a phone, hours taking in content, and we spend so little time, if any, listening to our Father's voice. And if we're going to believe what God says about us, we're going to need to hear it often. We have to counteract the messages we hear from our culture. And so we talked about making that a priority in our life. That's where spiritual formation happens and spiritual growth happens. But then let's get to Wednesday. Wednesday we talked about 
Um, when the world comes to change you, remember who you are. Because if you choose to be a Christian, it's not like the devil throws his hands up and says, all right, you're his, I give up. It's not how it works. Uh, I would say he probably comes at you ten times harder. Daniel is a great story about this. If, when you think of Daniel, you probably think of the fiery furnace and the lion's den. Maybe that one story about how Nebuchadnezzar becomes a beast of the field and eats grass for a while. I don't know what you think of. But Daniel chapter 1 is a great story to talk about how the world tries to change you. You want to read this with me? Uh, the first seven or eight verses. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So he's, he's attacked, taken captive, um, Jerusalem. Babylon's this great big power. And look at verse 3, what he it says he starts to do. It says, Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned to them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. It's interesting. We refer to some of these stories in Daniel to our kids as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel's his Hebrew name, but the other three, that's not actually their name, is it? The world's pretty good at getting us to identify in a wrong way, isn't it? What you see in this text is that King Nebuchadnezzar tried to change their identity through literature, through language, through education, through food and drink, and even their names. It wasn't like Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, friends, we're going to change completely who you are today. But a three-year process, he said, I'm going to try to subtly change you into someone you're not. Four men, or boys, decided they were going to be who God wanted them to be. But have you ever thought about how many other people there were who went along with it? That's the world our young people and you and I are living in. They want to change us from who God has called us to be, and many people are allowing it to happen, yet we have to take a stand and say, I'm going to be who God tells me to be. And I think the world wants to change you, and they do it in subtle ways, similar to how Nebuchadnezzar d does it. It's through the content you ingest. It's through getting you to make something a priority that you shouldn't. It's subtle. It's small. They don't force you, but it's almost death by a thousand cuts where they get you to change. Just, hey, what you put into your body. Just the relationships you have. What you're learning. They change you. And so as we talked, we, we emphasized Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. This is a verse every person should put on their heart. Every Christian needs it on their heart. Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. He resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. And therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him to not defile himself. He said, I am a Hebrew I'm an Israelite. That goes against the laws to eat that, to drink that. I'm going to be who God wants me to be, whether you're going to punish me for it or not. If you read the rest of the story, you see that God delivered them. But we have to make up our mind that we're going to be who God wants us to be, even if the world tries to change us. And we have to choose to be who we are in Christ before the opportunity arises to be someone else. If we wait until the moment that temptation comes, it's probably too late. When we wake up in the morning, we have to make up our mind to be who God wants us to be. It's important what we put into our brains early in the morning. It's important that when we go to bed, we've already made up our mind. This is who I am. I heard it in class this morning from Barbara Brandon. You've heard this before too. But how many of your parents said, remember who you are? Remember whose you are? That's the idea. You and I have to do that every single day so that we don't fall into these traps and temptations and these lies that the world gives in to us. And I think a big part of this message too is we need to surround ourselves with those who affirm our Christian identity. Have you ever noticed how in our world, how people identify, they tend to 
uh, lump themselves into big groups who all approve of who they are. For example, think of June, and it was Pride Month, right? When someone ha- claims that's their identity, who becomes their main group of influence? You get the idea. Well, that's career, um, you know, whatever it may be. When you surround yourself with people who affirm your identity, as a Christian, it should be no different. We have got to surround ourselves with people who affirm us as a Christian. Daniel had three other guys. I'm sure it meant a lot to Daniel that he had other men that could stand up with him to encourage them, to resist how the world was trying to change them. You and I need that for each other. Young people need that good sphere of influence, those good friends who say, yeah, we're Christians and we're going to live this way instead. You and I need that in our life. And that was the lesson Wednesday. And I'll give you one more Thursday because Friday, the, young, the, the older group, we went to bed at about 4 a.m. and woke up at 7 a.m. And so we just had a discussion of, hey, what would you take from this week? Um, so I'll just give you Thursday. Um, but Thursday, we talked about the ugly truth that there's two of us. If you're in my Sunday morning Bible class, we talked about the flesh this morning, and we talked about this reality of there, in some ways, are two of us in our life. I, I love the illustration that Marty used for his class with the 7th uh, and 8th graders. I, I don't know it perfectly because I wasn't there, but he brought like this big old basket cage that was, had a lid on it. And he started apparently getting out these big leather gloves and like these long snake tongs. And he said, there's a, there's a, there's a rattler in here. And you can imagine what a 7th and 8th grader is going to do when you say that, right? They're going to go. And um, I, apparently he would then open it up and it was just like a shaker, like a rattler. <laughs> but the way I took it was, hey, deep down in here, there is something that's very dangerous. And that's true for you and I as well. In Galatians 5 and verse 16 and 17 As Paul writes, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. He would talk about what the desires of the flesh look like, what they are. He'd say the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, Strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But he will go on to tell you the opposite. The fruit of the Spirit. You know the song, little kids. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. We talked to them about there's this truth of there in some ways are two of you. There is the you that wants to do what is holy and good and right with God. Who wants to be right with him. Who wants to love God. To live in his love and his goodness. Who wants to yield his peace. There's this other part of you that has many wicked, sinful temptations and desires, who wants the right thing the wrong way, or who sometimes wants the wrong thing. And you have to remember which one of you is actually you. This was kind of eye-opening to young people because they want to be right with God, they want to follow Jesus, but they also recognize, man, you know, I want some of these things we talk about that are so wrong, so often. And they have to remember which one they really are, because what happens is if they don't understand this, they end up picking one or the other. And the truth is that our flesh tends to be the stronger desire. We talked about this this morning. It's not our deeper desire. Our greatest desire is, to, is for God. But our stronger desires tend to be our surface level ones, the ones that pull us for temptation. That momentary temptation or desire seems to be so strong like it's almost irresistible. But you have to remember your deeper desire to be with God, to be his, his person, to do his will on heaven as it is on earth in your own body. So you have to remember which one of you you really are. And those were the main lessons. Friday they talked a lot about purpose, and we'll skip that for time's sake tonight. But those were the lessons we taught your young people this week. Does that seem like it's probably a pretty good week for them? 
I think that's stuff they need to hear. That's stuff I needed to hear. And what I took away from this week was a few things. Number one, I think we're really struggling with our identity. Today we have identity politics, sex is identity. We have made our hobbies and our job and our toys and money all about who we are. Yet that's not who we are at all. And young people are struggling, adults are struggling, college age kids are struggling. It's really important that we take time to remind ourselves over and over again who we are and what God says about us. Uh, I think it's interesting that throughout the New Testament, God continues to tell you who you are. And on a lot of those passages, he reminds you who you are. And we need to be reminded of that as well. The second thing I took away from this week is this. There, this congregation is filled with a lot of salt and a lot of light. And I got an up-close view of adults and kids who... Speaking of the adults, they took a week off of work where they get paid, except for me and Titus. Um, They took a week off of work to come spend it on a stiff bunk bed in 100 degree weather, long days, late nights, emotional, frustrating to take care of kids that do not belong to them. Why? It's Because they love the Lord and they love young people and they want to minister to them. And I was proud to be a member of the Choctaw Church of Christ this week. Not that I'm not proud any other week, but there's a lot of salt and a lot of light here. People who love other people, who want to invest in their spirituality, who want to see other people go to heaven, see them know Jesus, see them live the best life they can possibly live. We have a lot of light. We have a lot of salt, big bright lights. And I know there's more people besides those who are at camp this week. My third takeaway was this. The demise of the church has been greatly exaggerated. You ever hear those people who are all doom and gloom about the future of the church and young generations? I'm convinced those people do not spend any time with the young people in the church. If you spend time with young people and you listen to them, you listen to them sing, you listen to their thoughts about scripture, you have one-on-one conversations with them, you see them serve, you watch young men lead, Um, You watch girls who are welcoming and inclusive and who love other people, you would feel a lot better about the future of the church. Are they immature at times? Close your ears, kids. Yes. Do they have a lot of growing to do? Sure. You know who that reminds me of? You and me. We were all that when we were young. But the future of the church is in good hands. I got to watch multiple young men, including our own, give devotionals, lead service, I got to watch young women who had opportunities maybe to gossip or backbite and they decided to walk away from those situations and instead love other people. I watched them serve over and over again and spend a whole week pouring into spiritual, spiritual things. We sometimes feel uncertain about what's the church going to be like in 50 years. I don't know. But I'll tell you this. I think God's faithful and has it under control, don't you? I think there's a lot of young people who are going to take up these pulpits these positions, and they're going to do a great job. And we're going to pass this to this generation, and they're going to keep it going. I hate to say they're the future of the church, because they're not. They are the now. And honestly, we need to do a better job of letting them be the now, and not waiting 10, 20, 30, 40 years to let them serve and lead in the ways they can. But the future of the church has been greatly exaggerated in terms of its demise. I think it's doing okay. And you're going to do great things for the Lord, and we're excited to watch you do them. Those are my takeaways this week, and I I know that's kind of a different lesson for you tonight, but I hope you got something out of it. At the very least, I hope it encourages you. Uh, Tonight, if you don't know who you are, I would encourage you that there is somebody you need to know, and he can answer all of those questions for you. If you don't know God, you don't know who you are. And maybe you have forgotten who you are. We would love to help you realize who you are by studying with you. We would love, you to ha- love to help you have this identity in Christ Jesus by washing away your sins, by no longer being broken due to your sin, by be- but by being made whole in Jesus Christ. Or we'd love to pray with you and encourage you because this world beats us down, tries to change us, uh, but we can't let that happen. If there is something that we can do for you tonight, uh, let's do it now while we stand and while we sing.